right, buddy. What's uh, what are we talking about? Well, today, my man, we are going to talk about nine kitchen management systems you shouldn't live without. Okay, just nine. Just nine. Yeah, just nine. Only nine. All right. I think it's nine. Let me count real quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, these are really special to me and near and dear to my heart. And, and I just see too many operations that don't have them in play. Imagine a perfect world where you can build a restaurant, open the doors, and make loads of money. Unfortunately, those days are over. It takes great leadership, hard work, and long hours to operate a successful restaurant. Together, we can make it happen. This is Restaurantopia. All right, welcome back to Restaurant Topia. We got Anthony Hamilton, Brian Seitz, and we're talking about nine. Fuck. <laughs> Let me help you out, brother. Nine kitchen management systems you shouldn't live without. Nine kitchen management systems you should not live without. Love it. You did it perfectly. Thanks, Love brother. It. Yeah, man. How you feeling today? You good? Good. Let's get into this. All right, man. Let's dive right in. I see this a lot in consultation, man. And and listen, I, I back of the house folks, generally speaking, and I stress that word generally aren't the most technologically, I don't want to say advanced, like they don't have an affinity for techno- technology and organization all the time, right? You're dealing with artistic yeah. folks, maybe. I found earlier on in my career that that I did have a penchant for that stuff. So I was much less creative than a typical chef, but this is stuff that, that I absolutely love to get into. I have a penchant for the tedious. I love organization, that sort of stuff. So again, yeah. maybe it limited my creativity as a chef, but it certainly helped with the infrastructure. And out in my consultation, I see so many amazing operations that don't have a lot of this stuff done. And I wish they would because I think it makes your operation so much smoother and it gives you so much more power and leverage to use your data, to to use your information, also just to run a better ship. Yeah, it gives you insight on everything. Uh, there's no question. And, and you can measure your profitability, for for instance. And, and we've had this happen probably three, four times in the past three weeks that I know about just talking around the office. I had an operator call me the other day, hey, my food cost is high, can you help me out? I swear, it happened to me the other day. We just yeah. talked about this with Ross like a week ago. Yeah. And they're like, my food cost is high. Can you help me out? And I texted back. Well, what's your food cost supposed to be? And they said, I don't know. I never got around to it. I said, so how do you know it's high? Right? Like, I, I don't know. 44, 44% may be exactly what you're built for. But if you, you don't know, you didn't cost it out. How do I know if you're doing bad or good? Right? Mm-hmm. So that to me just it, poof, light bulb moment. So then I'm like, man, we got to talk about this more. There's some things in place that we have to talk about. Right? I, I think let's, let's break it down though. Let's reset, as Rev would say. Yeah, yeah. Let's reset. Let's, uh, no, wait, level set. Oh, yeah. Let's level set. Yes. Why didn't he do it? Because it's tedious. Yeah. It takes time. And there's yeah. probably not an easy system to, to make it happen. Um, No, there's templates and stuff. And uh, listen, I'm going to share a template for all these. Um, okay. uh, so they'll be in the show notes so everybody has an opportunity to take a look and see the format. Nice. No, uh, with recipe costing, look, if someone tells you that it's easy, they're probably lying. It, mm-hmm. It's not overly easy. It doesn't have to be super difficult. But at the same time, it's tedious as hell. Let's let's not kid ourselves. That's why no one does it, you know, because it's not fun. It takes a good 40 hours to get through a normal menu. But in a post-pandemic menu where things are smaller, you can get it done fairly quickly. I don't know if 40 hours is going to be the commitment. I mean, yeah. It's a smaller menu, of course. Like yeah. if, if you run a static menu and you yeah, have yeah. 10, 12 options, it's super easy. Yeah. Like I've managed those places. You should see the costing sheets I use because I, I let my nerdism come out and I just dove way deep and yeah. get way too detail oriented. A normal size menu at a, at a mid-scale family restaurant. Yeah, I, I still think, again, post-pandemic is different, but you're 30, 40 hours average. You know, the people I talk to that, that I know cost menus for a living, they do it on the side. It's it's still for them. They've done it a million times, still tedious as ever, yeah. right? It's not fun. There are ways you can simplify it. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Something I did. It's not as accurate, but man, is it more achievable because it's not as tedious, right? Mm-hmm. But I digress. Let's start with a top, right? Let's start with an old fashioned order guide. Do you know how many operators or chefs or, or kitchen managers I see still using just a notebook paper and walking around and just kind of looking at their stuff and saying, <laughs> oh, I need this. I need that. Just gut shotting everything. It seems like there may be some waste in that operation. I just just a little bit. Is yeah. it effective? Sure. You get your stuff in. But yeah. maybe you have 10, 12 extra cases of this, that, and the other, and that's a lot of cash sitting on the shelves, right? So That, that could go bad. Uh, of course. Yeah, yeah, there's no question about it. And and so there's there's a financial aspect to all these as well, and it, arguably that w- that's what drives this show. So with an order guide, listen, throw away your notebook and, and get a printed inventory guide. And, and even if you use multiple purveyors, every purveyor you have – especially Hillcrest Food Service, which is the best purveyor out there for independent restaurants, they will give you an order guide. And if you, your rep will actually come in and help you set it up shelf to sheet, meaning they will put your order guide in the order of how you store things on the shelf and in your coolers to make it super easy for you to go and get this. They can use their order history to develop par levels for you. 
So you have the par level. If You should always be at three cases of this, two cases of that, one case of this. And if you're less than that, just order enough to get you to that threshold. Yeah. Super easy, a thousand times percent more accurate, and it costs you about $2 for a clipboard and maybe a buck for a pen. Mm-hmm. Really, that's what it comes down to. So you have to have an order guide in place. Again, if you have multiple distributors, that's understandable. Just make sure that you consolidate it on the one Excel spreadsheet. Do the shelf to, to sheet system. Let me tell you, it, it changes lives. There's no question about it. Next up, and this is going to blow your mind, a recipe book. Yeah. yeah. Can that I tell you? interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's, I can't. I appreciate you playing yeah. into this. You'd be surprised how many don't exist, right? It's it's a file here. Mm-hmm. It's a notebook sheet here. It's in someone's head here. It's there. But what happens when these people quit? How do you expect to be consistent if you've never have, if you don't have a recipe book? No, because Joe does his prep this way. Mary does hers this way. Mm-hmm. And so and so. I had a student in class actually worked at a, at a, a really popular burrito place you probably heard of. And she's like, well, you should come when I make the guacamole. And I'm like, why is that? And she goes, because it tastes better. I'm like, well, wait a minute. How does it taste better? She goes, I sneak in some extra salt. And I said, that's great. And I appreciate that. But what are you doing? I was like, don't you guys have a recipe book? She's like, oh, yeah. And they're managed. I said, of course you guys have a recipe book. Because she's she's sneaking in salt. So if she's willing to do this at a highly, highly managed national chain, imagine what your employees are doing at Independent where your recipe is 50 yards away, right? Well, and especially someone with an ego and it's like, oh. Oh yeah, I, I, the the recipe's good, but I'm gonna make it better. Like, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's crazy. A, that's a whole nother topic. We were just talking <laughs> about that with a famous Cleveland Browns wide receiver recently. My buddy and I were talking about yeah. that exact same thing last night. Sometimes addition by subtraction is important, regardless. Ah, oh, th- so so good. You mean a former Browns wide receiver? Yeah, yeah. He's unemployed right now, but you know yeah, he'll, he'll he'll land on his feet. He'll oh, find there's him. no question. He's right. he's already on his feet. He's, he's yeah, fine. Yeah. He'll, he'll he'll find it. He'll find a home. Won't, won't be the uh, a beautiful Cleveland. <laughs> Paris of the Midwest. Mm. So the recipe book, man, it's all digital now. It doesn't have to be like a book book, but you should definitely take the time to put these in one format. And again, I'll drop a format in yeah. the the show notes that are easy to follow. This keeps everybody on the same page. Don't rely on a printed piece of paper or a notebook to hold your company secrets. Put them somewhere safe on a cloud in Silicon Valley. It's going to protect you from everything. Someone walks out and takes your book with you. What are you going to do? If you got it on this cloud, you're good. So anyway, make sure you have a recipe book intact. And I know that seems very elementary and, and but the fact is, I'm here in front of a microphone mm-hmm. talking about this in hopes to disseminate this information to a lot of operators. Yeah, I visit a lot of operators. I talk to a ton of operators, and I'm still saying this. So this is a problem. People should take the time to do this. There's no question about it. This will make your operation better. Without a doubt. More consistent, um, easier to access. And, and obviously, too, expectations now become very clear in what the, the performance measure is on your guacamole or whatever food item it is. So now you can manage it, too. Because if it, if it tastes off, then you have a common ground to hold that employee accountable, right? Yeah. It's a big deal. Because if you say, hey, this doesn't taste right, what happened? Well, I don't know. I didn't see the recipe. <laughs> you know, like, right? well, that's fair. Okay, well, we don't have a recipe book, so what am I going to do? We're at a stalemate, right? Or, or, or my favorite one, you get 35 comments on why the guacamole tastes salty. <laughs> yeah. And, and then you figure out, like, oh, I think someone's adding salt to the guacamole. Like, <laughs> yes, they are, because you have no... Yeah, there's uh, no standards in place, yeah. right? Yeah, there's no SOPs, man. Yeah. So you got to have a recipe book. That one's a little easier than the next one. The next one is a costing template. Okay. The good news about a costing template is once you do the work up front, and, and again, it's a lot of work, and, and it's not everybody's favorite thing. There's a lot of tricky math conversions in there. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, we have people like myself or, or even Jim Schnur that can help with this sort of thing. Yeah. So if you're a Hillcrest customer, lean on us. And uh, if you want to get your menu costed out and want to be a Hillcrest co- customer, just talk to us. Yeah. You can lean on us for that too. But we'll help you with this. And we'll set you up with a template. We'll do some of the push-ups for you. Once you get it done, it's such a sigh of relief. But having this costing template done, I can't believe I have to profess the importance of this. But going back to that call is now I have a benchmark. If my menu theoretically is costed out to be 34% Mm -hmm. and my chef or kitchen manager comes in at 38%, it's very evident they're not performing exactly how they should. So now let's do a deep dive into why that happens. But we have a measurable objective that everybody can hit, and we have crystal clear expectations on what these measurable objectives are. This is your sport, and I'm going to sound preachy here. Yeah. But if you're making a cheeseburger, Mm -hmm. what does that cheeseburger cost you? Yeah. What should it cost you? Right. Is someone putting two slices of cheese on it when there only should be one? What are you doing to that cheeseburger that is going to cause you to lose money. Yeah. Again, once you do the homework, you can update your costing template as prices fluctuate in, in probably an hour, right? Because mm-hmm. you can see the, the drastic. You yeah, know, yeah. So you spend a half hour to an hour a week of upkeep on this. I, I don't know about you. I don't know a lot about business, but it's pretty imperative to understand how much your cost of goods is, especially in relation to profitability, right? Like uh-huh. it's, it's imperative. A hundred percent. And you got to understand you can't do a, an accurate review of menu mix or any of the other or menu engineering, which is one of my favorite things. Absolutely. Yeah. 
or take that next step to really in- improve your game mm-hmm. until you have that costing done. Yeah, there's no question. And, and I see it a lot of times with, with the menu analyzation. It comes down to just running your sales mix. And we just say, okay, these 10 items are the least popular. Let's get rid of them. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. There may be more to the story analytically, yeah. but you have to put the costing template behind it to understand if it's a plow horse or a puzzle or whatever. There's adjustments. It, it, the, the sales mix doesn't tell all the stories. So you may be missing out on some major financial opportunities by just doing that. Yeah. And, and it can prevent so many mistakes and, and obviously heighten the, the effectiveness of your analysis and what you're doing. And again, if you go back to the scenario where you say, oh my God, our food cost is 45%. Yeah. Okay, you want to go get mad at the chef, but then the chef says, "Well, what am I supposed to do?" Yeah, and you're like, "Well, I, I don't know. What are you supposed to do? It just needs to be lower, right?" Well, that's no target, right? Like, that's no. not a target. So, give them measurable objectives. Cost out your menu yesterday. It's incredibly beneficial in so many different aspects. Well, and and I can tell you a little story about what happens when you just yell at the chef and say it needs to be lower. Yeah. So what happens is that chef starts cheating the customer. Oh, of course. So now the portion size is smaller. This is smaller. Yeah. And then the what quality ha- the, the quality wanes. Yep. Quality goes down. Yep. So, and then you start shopping distributors and you lose loyalty and you lose the benefits of the loyalty. You uh-huh. see how this is starting to snowball, yeah. right? And and this is the spiral of death. Yep. So by knowing this information and having this right off the rip, so, so valuable. Great points, man. So up next on the costing, I mean, we could talk about a costing template for days, but let's move on. Uh, a good old fashioned prep list. This is another one I don't see enough. Oddly enough, I, I can't believe this, but having some sort of organized spreadsheets where you understand exactly every item that needs prepped in-house yep. and exactly how much you should have on hand for that particular day of the week. Yep. It's not rocket science, really. It really It's doable. It, you do it once. You update it occasionally. But, yeah, when you change your menu. Yeah, but right. at the end of the day, this is stuff that you have to be doing for your operation. Then you can take vacations. Then you can yeah. you know, see your kid's football game. Mm-hmm. Then you can be away from the operation for five minutes without it breaking. Yep, That's why this stuff is so important. I, I agree wholeheartedly. And what happens is when you don't have a prep list with everything on there, inevitably – your prep cook makes a couple misses a couple items because they're working from memory, and yeah. we all know how memory fails us constantly, no, right? Thought, yeah. So then you're in middle service, and you you don't have any salsa rojo to get you through, right? And it's a three hour process because you got to toast the chilies, you got to puree them, everything else. Now you got to eighty six that menu item. Mm-hmm. Now you pissed off some customers, yeah. all because you didn't take the time to put it on a prep list, right? Yeah. And these things can be avoided. So and that kind of dovetails into one and a couple of down. But anyway, portion guide. This is a big one too. Ooh, I love portion guides. Yeah, portion guides. Super easy. Takes five minutes. You just go through your menu and you find out everything that needs portioned, whether mm-hmm. it's the center of the plate item, a steak, a fish, a chicken, or pasta. It could be broccoli. Could be anything. If you portion it out, and it's important to your costing template to keep these things in portion, why don't you post this in your kitchen somewhere as a reference or a key? Yeah. So if anybody is doing prep in the middle of service during some downtime or even during their prep shift, and they say, oh man, what's a calamari supposed to weigh? They have a reference hanging on the wall that says five ounces, man. So you... Well, and I can tell you, this is what happens in in practical scenario on the customer side. They come into your restaurant, they get the calamari, they had forty four ounces of calamari, yeah. and they're like, "This place is the best." All right. And then the next time they come back and they get eight ounces of calamari, and they're like, "Oh, the portion sizes went way down. This place yeah. is this place is so cheap and greedy." Yeah, 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 it's like, no, no, no. You just got lucky one time when, you know, Carl was doing the portioning. Carl's hangover is sabotaging your entire business, just so you know, right? <laughs> like Carl got real cynical and it is nausea from a great night the night before. But yeah, it, it's absolutely that, Brian. Consistency is king. We know that. Not from a, a customer satisfaction standpoint, because again, every time they walk in their door, they're gambling that the money they put down is going to return a, a good a good ROI. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's like buying a bottle of wine. You're just guessing the contents in there are going to be great. And you're willing to wager X amount of dollars for that. Restaurants, same thing. So you got to make sure that that bet comes to fruition for the, for the customers. No question. Portion guides, a great way to do that. Super yep. easy to do. Next up, build sheets. Similar to portion guides, but these are specific menu items. So if I'm looking at that same calamari, I have the portion sheet that tells me there's five ounces in there. My build sheet's going to echo that. But then my build sheet's also going to tell me how many ounces of that tomato aioli I got to put on there? All right. How many pieces of fried basil I got to put on there? How many tablespoons of fried capers I'm going to drizzle over the top or, or whatever it is? And you put those on each station, yep. right? You have a reference. And it's twofold. A, you're giving your employees complete guidance of what to do. You trained them on it. You have it in memory. And now you give them a reminder. But you have that measurable objective. Again, if something looks wrong, you have that something, that common ground to default to for accountability's sake and say, listen, Carl. You see this on the wall. We've went over this a million times. What do you suggest we do here? And Carl's going to feel real bad, apologize, and move on, and hopefully better, you know, be better. I so, love it. Easy stuff, man. No, it just needs to be done. That's it. It doesn't take much time. I can help you with it. Just so you know. Yeah. Well, call Anthony. Yeah, please I mean, call me. It's yeah. it's literally that easy. And check out our show notes 
at restaurantopia.com. It's in there. So Anthony put together some great resources. Very, this is one of our best show notes ever as far as <laughs> practical guides yeah, this, of things that you can that you can implement tomorrow. Yeah, thanks, man. And it's the stuff you should have, right? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. And I didn't realize this at first too. Like this stuff grew on me. So don't no, feel no. bad if you don't have it. But let's let's turn the page and make sure you do have it. No, no. And, and to me, it's critical too. If you want to go to if you want to go to location number two, scalability, man. You, this is you have to have this. This is your foundation. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So next up, we got three more. Next up, line check. A sheet this is a line check, right? Yep. Have you seen these before? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I didn't, and I don't know why. I, I think we were just cocky in our, our fine dining chefism in the early 2000s that we didn't feel we needed these. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until later in my tenure as a chef that I realized, wow, how important is this? And so what it is, is I just take every item from every station mm-hmm. and list it. So since I have my build sheets and my portion guides and my costing yep. templates already done, I already know everything. I just got to copy and paste to build this thing. So this line check sheet, why I love it is... is so I've copied and pasted all this data into, into a document of some sort. It's on a clipboard with a pen. My kitchen manager or chef, it's maybe a half hour before we open. They go down to every station and they go over every single item on every station. Mm-hmm. If done right, depending on the restaurant, this could be a 15 to 45 minute process worthy investment no matter what the time stake is for two reasons a i'm checking every ingredient that's on that station i'm keeping everybody honest and making sure everything's peak freshness and to make sure that we have enough of everything right so i'm helping the customer i'm holding the cooks accountable i'm helping them grow also too what happens when i'm spending time with them is now all of a sudden i ask about their dog and their family now i have a vested interest in this employee so now it's twofold because a i'm checking their their effectiveness but then I'm also taking a vested interest in our personal life, which we know bodes, bodes very, very well for culture. And and guess what? These cooks want to spend time with the chef. A lot of yeah. times that's why they're at the location is to learn as a cook. Mm-hmm. So the more one-on-one time they get with the chef, the better. Well, hell, this dovetails three or four different notions. Perfect. Why not do it, right? And then also in the middle of service, you're not running out of crazy stuff. Because the cook's like, I thought I had a backup. You know, I, I thought I had this. It's like, no, you didn't. No. But now you have the manager questioning them. Now you keep them honest and you do it ahead of time. So if they are missing that backup, you have time to recover and time to put it in place. That way you're not 86ing something. And, and the restaurant folks know when you 86 something, you always sell three or four more of it. Oh, it always happens. Every time. Yep. Yeah. Every single time. So then you got to go disappoint customers. So this helps you with that. You're not serving that that garnish that looks all wilted and bruised. Yeah. You're, you're not running out of stuff. You're not serving something spoiled amazing amazing tool super easy to implement and it bodes well for everybody the moment the server tells me you're out of the chilean sea bass even if i didn't want it now i want it yeah it's, yeah, it's right. psychological it's like yeah. oh my god that that does sound good i the do exclusivity, like a, right? a light fish that sounds hmm but how bad does it when you order it and then 10 minutes later they come back oh that sheepishly <laughs> <laughs> that's the worst that as i like are you kidding me yeah. Like I already have eaten it three times in my head. Like yeah. <laughs> I've done the practice, right? Yeah. I've done the reps. I, like, I can't wait. I can't wait to have it. Yeah. And then they tell you, you got to order something else. And yeah. then what happens is, is you're disappointed. Then you switch gears and be like, all right, I want a strip steak. Well done. And now we got to put all the other entrees at the table on hold for another 30 minutes yeah. to get that strip steak done. And kind you of, see where this is going, right? What, what kind of animal would eat it well done? I, well, hey, listen, you know what I, you know, I used to feel that way. Oh, come on. Can I tell you what happened to me? All right. What? I got patient somehow. I got weak. And yeah. I said, you know what? I'm here to make your experience great. I don't care if you do want to eat the bottom of the shoe. I'm going to make it the best damn bottom of a shoe okay. you've ever had, right? That's the difference between you and I. I want to go out to the table, meet the guest, and say, who hurt you? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Lay down on my couch. What, what Let's did, unpack this What shit. did your parents do to you to make you have this palate? Because this, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a safety issue is what it is. <laughs> Because <laughs> my grandma told me I'd get worms is oh, really what it comes oh down to. God. So yeah, yeah, that's good stuff, man. So anyway, the, the the line checklist is imperative. It helps so much. Please, please, please implement them. Um, the next up is a center of the plate inventory guide. Mm-hmm. And I love this because not a lot of restaurants are counting inventory on a regular basis. Let's face it, when you're short staffed, that's one of the things that goes out quickly, right? And it takes a long time to count every shelf, every item. But at the very minimum, count your center of the plate stuff every night. Yep. And we talk about mitigating theft in restaurants and how important it is. Well, what are they stealing? They're stealing the steaks to go cook out on a Sunday. Yep. Or they're stealing a halibut to have a special dinner with their wife or, or the Nantucket based scallops or whatever it is. But if you take that stuff that's really essential to you from a financial aspect, the things that cost eight to ten dollars a portion, you only have to count maybe 30, 40 things a night, right? Like yeah. or, or maybe it's 10 things, but 20 or 30 of each. Keep everybody honest. Mm-hmm. Keep your money honest. Go back there and count just those things on a nightly basis, whoever your closing manager is, and make sure that they're rectified. Well, and it also sends a message to the staff that yeah. we're watching this. We're looking at this. Right. This is this is not an opportunity for you. You do, you do it with liquor. This is not an opportunity for you to steal. Yeah. 
And that's, that's a good one, just keeping people honest. So and I think this protects the integrity of your business. It, it certainly inhibits the, the notion or the temptation for good employees to steal from you. Maybe they have a lapse of, of reason. Judgment, yeah. yeah, judgment, thank you. Um, so it, it helps out in that. And, and obviously, we're talking about profitability here. You can't can't be profitable if your your stuff's missing, right? No, you can't be you can't be hosting the the barbecue at, your, <laughs> at, at the line cook's house. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It may or may not have been part of those. <laughs> so, anywho, um, last but not least, this one is this one's actually fun for me because I like writing. But okay. menu descriptions, All menu right. descriptions. We don't see this enough. Yeah, right. Uh, have you ever seen them before? Rarely, and I'll tell you where this is key. It, not just for the back of house, but for social media for your website, people want to really understand what the meal is. And a good menu description is so vital, especially when we're talking about servers and how your staff is trained. Yeah. What everyone knows what Chilean sea bass is, but what is our Chilean sea bass? How do we prepare it? What, what uh, garnishes go with it? What sides go with it? What is it? What is it? The essence of that chef's artistic expression so one thing you might put in that menu description is that chilean sea bass is not actually a bass that's no. a complete marketing term did you know that yes i did know that it's that's called right. a patagonian toothfish yes as a matter of fact not as doesn't flow off the tongue uh, yes it sounds cool though but yeah it doesn't yeah. sound like you want to eat it right like it's <laughs> full of teeth but that being said the menu descriptions to your point training 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 how many times you go to a restaurant and you're like oh um i i love this dish can you tell me where this fish comes from yeah and the server looks at you blankly and says let me go check with the chef water <laughs> We, we could just end the show there. Yeah. We're done. That's, we're going to Costanza it. We can't yeah. beat it. We're done. That just, you just stopped every thought dead in its tracks, man. Like I just, so, yes, that's what they say, water. But let me go ask a chef to find out what water, right? Yeah, yeah. Or, hey, uh, I'm allergic to peanuts. And is this dish going to be okay? I don't know. Let me go check with the chef. Yeah, right? yeah. So when you take menu descriptions, what you do as a chef or a manager, you sit down and you, you you write out in prose, essentially, the story behind a dish. Why do you have it on the menu? Why is it special? Where does it come from? Maybe some fun facts about it so they can tell a story, do a little song and dance at yeah. the table. Um, also, allergens, why customers would like it, taste profile, flavor profiles, all these things. And if there's some family history or organizational history behind it, my God, that's a romantic story to tell. I, I want it. everybody to have that content. So I spent a lot of time doing this. I would write a good half page for every dish. It was probably too much looking back on it. Now I would bullet point five, six bullet points. But I would say no. I would say you were spot on. You were ahead of the time because what I would do is I'd take that manifesto that you created yeah, on, it was a manifesto on, too, on the yeah. Chilean sea bass yeah. and turn that into the text for 25 social media posts. Oh my God, there you have it. See, where were you at? Yeah, I know. Where right? were you at? There you go. Now, I don't even know if Facebook was a thing when I started these, but I, I love doing these. And then as part of the server training packet, we would hand these out and mm-hmm. then we would test on it. Yeah. And the servers had to get, in my day, they had to get a, a 90% on it. But looking back, I would now make it 100%, right? Because why would we train to 90%? That's crazy. Yeah. It's trained to 100%. But these make your servers and managers and everybody involved so much more powerful because they have the knowledge now. So now they can confidently answer pretty much any customer question they have right at the table without disrupting service. Mm -hmm. So not only does it look good from an aesthetic standpoint, from a hospitality standpoint, from a business efficiency standpoint, it makes a lot more sense because your server's wasting less steps going back and forth. It just, it creates this whole notion of professionalism that you don't find at a lot of places. And you could save someone's life because the allergen piece is pretty important. And sometimes as chefs, we we don't communicate well. We bury something in the the foundation of a dish and we forget to communicate that. Could be an issue, right? So I love making my staff experts and menu descriptions are a way to get there. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. So listen, those are the nine kitchen management systems I don't think you should live without. And if you don't have these together, please let me know. Let me help you. Go to the show notes. You can get a template for all these. At least see where my head's at on it. Reach out. I'll help you uh, extrapolate any data or or expound upon these and make them functional for your establishment. Thank you, Anthony. Awesome show. You got it, man. My pleasure. Truly. Good deal. It's a high quality pod. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, everybody. Take care. Adios. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Restaurantopia. The gratitude that we have for each and every one of you spending your precious time to listen to this podcast is immeasurable. Please make sure to tell a friend about this podcast. And also, if you have any feedback for us, visit us on restaurantopia.com and drop us a line. You can also subscribe on your favorite place to listen to podcasts. Thank you and have a great day. We are excited to announce the Restaurantopia VIP Text Club. Join by texting the word podcast to 844 928 4257. You will get access to exclusive content, industry news, deals, announcements, pro tips, and more.
The VIP Test Club is an exclusive community of independent restaurant owners and professionals. Join today. Message and data rates may apply. Please check our website for our terms of service and privacy policy. We also want to thank our sponsor, Hillcrest Food Service. If you are a local independent restaurant and are looking for a distributor who has chef and operational consulting, provides marketing support, does menu reviews, and most importantly, wants you to be successful, reach out to Hillcrest Food Service at hillcrestfoods.com.